Hello everybody, my name is James Davies and welcome to Photo Chat Vlog on YouTube. Today's video is going to be all about the Diana camera and what I did with mine on Diana Day, which was a hashtag driven day of photography coming out of social media. Now I got into the idea of Diana Day through my friend Denise, who I only know electronically. She lives in the USA and I live here in England. We formed a unique friendship online based on our mutual love of film photography. And she said that the 4th of August 2018 was Diana Day. Now, what is a Diana? Well, it's a type of camera. Here, in fact, is a Diana. An actual genuine Diana made in China in the 1960s. There are more modern versions available, and we'll come to those in a moment. But basically, a Diana is a really cheap camera. Everything is made of plastic, even the lens. There's a few metal parts, obviously. But it doesn't make for a great camera. And in fact, it's known for taking somewhat fuzzy photographs. And I have to say, if you haven't already spotted it, that because I can't work my video camera as well as I'd like, some of this video is shot in the spirit of the Diana, meaning I got the focus wrong and it's pretty fuzzy. But I hope you can forgive me for that. So from what I understand from reading online, the Diana was the sort of thing that you got for free if you bought a certain amount of petrol or something. This basically wasn't meant to be anything other than a really cheap novelty camera. It wasn't like anything being made by well-known camera companies of the day. And the Diana and other variants went out there into the world. And I guess for most people, they were a disappointment. The plastic lens is blurry. They're really badly made and are really flimsy. And they're not precision instruments. But for some people, everything that was bad about them added up to a kind of cool aesthetic. And it was a photographer called Nancy Rexroth who used one for an exhibition and a book called Iowa which ended up giving the camera some notoriety and cult status. I first heard about them through the various lamography enthusiasts who came online in the early part of the millennium, and I looked and looked and looked for years in thrift stores in the USA for one, but I could never find one. I eventually got this one online a couple of years ago for £20 from a guy called Hamish Gill, who runs the 35mmc website. Now you might be able to see whilst I've been handling it that it's a big camera, it takes what's called 120 roll film, known as medium format. You might also see that mine says 80 clicks on it, and that's because I actually have some 35mm film already loaded into this camera, and I needed to know how many times I had to wind on the film as I had to tape out the frame window that's on the back. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between 35mm and 120 film. Basically, 35mm film is smaller, and it comes in a metal can that protects it from the light, and it has sprockets on it that allow a 35mm camera to wind the film in and out of the can whilst it's being exposed. You can see a roll of that here on the right. 120 film is bigger, and it's rolled up with special paper which protects it from the light. As you take photos and wind the film on, it's rolled onto what's called a take-up reel, and the paper has numbers on the back which tell you through a window in the camera how many shots you've taken. You can see a roll on the left, and how much bigger it is than the 35mm film. So if you want to use a smaller 35mm film in a medium format camera like the Diana, you have to get the film wound around the take-up reel really tight, and there's a lot of space either side. But thanks to the wonders of modern technology, you can get these 3D printed adapters, which fit onto the 35mm canister, and they allow you to make it the same size as the take-up reel and, and fit into the camera more effectively. I had these ones on a roll of Poundland Agfa film inside this camera, and it had been in there for a couple of years by the time Diana Day rolled around. Anyway, here are some of the Diana's features, if you can call them that. You've got this really flimsy weather marking control for adjusting the exposure, which just slides a piece of plastic behind the lens. This gets left on full sunlight, as it were for me, because it's so unreliable. There's also a bulb and a regular shutter control, but that's about it. There's no real control over multiple exposures, for example. And with the 35mm film that I've got in it and no backing paper, it's really hard to know whether there have been any double exposures on the film. It's pretty simple to use, but being so light and flimsy, it's a really strange experience to take pictures with it. Now, I mentioned that that was an original one, and here is a modern copy, the Diana Plus, made by Lomography, in a rather dusty box. The story behind this one is that my mate in Australia... A real old mate I've known since I was about 14 worked in an op shop, which is like a charity shop. And she got this from there and thought, Jim Davies, he takes photos, maybe he'll like it. 
and she sent it to me for my 40th birthday. Now, I've not actually used it yet, so it's going to get its first airing for Diana Day, after we take it out of the box. I will confess that I have already opened the box in the past. It had a book in it, and that is somewhere else in my house. But as you can see, you open the box like this, and it all comes apart, and eventually you get the camera out. A quick comparison with the original Diana, and you can see they're mostly the same, but the new one has an extra pinhole setting. And all of the action of the controls, like the weather wheel, is much firmer and more reliable. You can see the different apertures if we look through the lens. And there's an improved window on the back for reading frame numbers if you actually use proper 120 roll film. Now if we take the back off, you can see where the big medium format 120 film goes. And there are some masks that you can use for getting different size pictures. And if we hold this up and cock the shutter, you can see the light flash in. And if we put it in bulb mode, you can see the different apertures too. It is really very similar to the original Diana. So what film could I shoot in my Diana Plus? Well, I think everybody should have a big box of film marked freaky, brackets, expired, with a bunch of interesting stuff in it, just like this. Now what is in this box? Well, there's a partially opened box of Portra 160NC. I have a roll of Kodak XXX and a roll of good old Ilford FP4. Better still, though, here is the actual oldest film I own, this gratis spool film, which I got from a camera fair. Now, this is the one that I used in the earlier comparison footage with 35mm film. And from what I understand, gratis spool gave you a new film every time you sent one in for processing. I guess gratis, meaning free. As you can see, this one is unused, and it's going to stay that way. I'm not going to use this roll right now. It works better as an intact curio, I think, and so the choice between black and white and colour is Portra. I'm going to use Portra for colour film in this Diana camera. So that's the cameras. Now Diana Day was on the 4th of August 2018 and I was travelling to my hometown that day for a family birthday celebration. So I spent much of my time on the road. But I did shoot some film that day and I did shoot some the next day making it kind of Diana weekend I guess. I'm sorry Denise if that bends the rules somewhat but what did the pictures come out like? Well, very Diana-esque. I'll explain that in a moment. I had a lot of trouble loading the 120 film into the Diana Plus. It basically didn't want to wind on at all, and it was really hard to see the backing paper through the window. I had to open the back and reload the film, and it was all very much touch and go. But if we go through these one by one, we can see what happened. Now note from the start that they're square images and the video is obviously widescreen so there's going to be a lot of black showing up either side. That's just the way it is for most of these pictures. I have zoomed in in a couple of them but square pictures, oblong TVs, I don't really know what we can do about that. But as you can see there are all sorts of problems with this first shot. Mostly a great big light leak on the left and the size isn't quite right. I couldn't work out what was going on with the frame window on the back of the camera. I wanted to set it to 12 square images, but I think I ended up having it set to 16 narrow images at first. So these first few shots are very close together, and they're not square. You can also see the film name at the top of all the shots, as I had no mask in the camera. So this is basically what a badly loaded picture in a toy camera looks like. The next one is a bit better, although there's still a juicy light leak on the left. And there's also some overlap with the previous image. Now it's worth mentioning that these were taken in Boston, Lincolnshire in the UK from a guest house I was staying in. It's the view from the window and I used to live in one of those houses down there. So this was quite a scene for me to see in the first place. But as an image it's certainly representative of what you could see. The camera is functioning as a mechanism for recording an image on film. Now you will see from the next few photographs that I actually took this image more than once. And I think this version we're looking at is using the pinhole, and I think I exposed it for about 10 seconds. You can see that the tonality is different. It's also fuzzier because although I had the camera on a tripod, the whole thing is so flimsy it's impossible to open the shutter without the whole thing moving around. And in the edges you can also see something from the actual lens mount, like the rim perhaps. And in the bottom left of the image I also think you can see the window frame as well. Now I think the next one is a better pinhole image, but there's a whopping great light leak on the right. Now this is okay. I knew this was an occupational hazard of using the Diana. But it doesn't add much to the image overall. 
And in fact, sometimes light leaks end up looking all the same. You see one, and you've seen them all. And to kind of prove my point, the next image also has the same light leak visible. Now this is almost certainly from when I had to reload the film under the duvet in the guest house after I realised it wasn't winding on properly. So this leak would have gone onto the film before any of the shots were taken. As it is, we're not actually getting anywhere with continuing to shoot the same scene over and over again, so I decided to give up on that. And the next one was taken pointing the camera the other way out of the window. And it would have been using the normal shutter. There are no more pinholes on the roll as far as I can see. Now I like this image. It's definitely a rendering of the scene that I saw, but it has that dreamy impressionist thing going on that makes using a toy camera worthwhile when you can get it to work. I say toy camera. People thought these Diana plastic cameras were so flimsy they may as well be toys. Now this shot is really classically Diana as far as I can see. What you can see is the vignetting. These are the dark shadows in the corners caused by the lens not being good enough to actually bend all of the photons down onto the film. And there's also softer, squidgy edges where the image is not as sharp as the centre. And the centre itself isn't very sharp anyway. I'm going to zoom in now to show how the image gets distinctively less sharp as we move towards the edges of the image. And now I think there's a kind of attractiveness here, even when technically it's not very good. There is something about the corner of the eye going on, if you know that phrase. You see it from the corner of your eye. You're not looking at the sharpest thing, but you can see there's something going on. If you check out how blurred out the traffic lights look, for example, you, you know, it's not technically a perfectly flat image, but it works. It makes me think, anyway, of what I'm looking at right now, where things are clearer in the centre than they are at the periphery. As for the colours, well, you can hardly call this saturated or warm or anything of the clichés that people talk about analogue photography. It's just a best guess of some sort of exposure, but it's definitely different to a digital image. And I can see why someone well acquainted with a digital camera, but looking for poetry, would fall in love with some of the results from a camera like a Diana. Now this next shot is another classic Diana photograph with all the blurring and the vignetting. The big church is St. Botolph's in Boston, or as it's more well known, Boston Stump, and it dominates the landscape in the town. I really like this image. It's more like my own memories of the town now that I no longer live there, which is an interesting thing to think about. And to emphasise how much the church dominates the town, and to think a little bit more about memories and photographs, this is a couple of streets away, it's about 10 minutes walk away, and the stump is still there, overlooking everything. Now this scene is interesting because the car park is actually where my junior school used to be. And me and all of my siblings and a bunch of my cousins all went to school on this site between the ages of about 7 and 11. There are various photographs taken in this car park if you look hard enough on my Flickr stream. And we actually used to live nearby as well. Now if you think of a place in your life where you spent a lot of time in your formative years, like the school playground, or I spent hundreds of days here, running around and playing, And those memories are faded and blurred around the edges, and they have dark corners, just like this picture. Now this next picture is interesting for a number of reasons. It was taken in the neighbourhood where I used to live, but there used to be a big factory here behind the railings, and it was pulled down recently, and it's actually gone. I was out walking with my cousins, and they took a photograph of me taking this photo, which you can see here. Now again, the actual picture has got all the Diana stuff going on with the vignetting and the blurriness, but it was very sad for me to see the factory demolished, and I love how the Diana Plus and the Portra film have combined to render some of that sadness that's inherent in this scene for me. The camera phone image of me taking the photograph just seems that bit jollier, and it doesn't seem to say the same thing. Now if you don't get what I'm talking about, then maybe this image, which is the last one that I'm going to show you from the roll, this image might contextualise things a little bit. So this was taken right on the other side of the factory site from the previous image, actually a whole block away. Now again, you can see the stump overlooking everything, and this is a scene that I thought I would never see, because not only did I spend a lot of time as a kid riding my bike around the factory, but a whole lot of my family worked there. 
And if you knew someone from Boston in the 1950s or 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s, and it's not ridiculous to say that someone in their family probably worked there too. And the whole thing has gone. It was a major source of employment for the town. And it's just strange. It's things like you never saw that view of the backs of those houses. So there's something very middle-aged about this image for me. It, it shows how my own life is reflected in an image which shows that nothing is permanent and that things that I thought were real can actually disappear. And it's not just that the factory building has gone as well. It's the idea that they probably won't build another factory there. And that if I ever needed convincing that the town and the times have changed, then this scene is it. New houses will probably be built there. And the people who work in them will do different jobs. Now, of course, nothing lasts forever. And that story is the same all over the world. And middle-aged guys will always be wistful about the old days. But... I don't know, there's something about the way this image conveys that message to me that I like. So those are the images from the Diana Plus that I took on Diana Day with Kodak Portra 160 NC film. So now, over to the photos from the original Diana that had the 35mm Agfa Vista film in it. Now, some were taken on Diana Day and some were not. But let's look through them all anyway. Now, straight up, you're not going to be seeing the full picture here. I mean that quite literally, in fact, because one of the reasons for shooting 35mm film in a medium format camera is the ability to expose the area around the sprockets. And these are the things that are used to advance 35mm film. So when you look at this photograph, which was taken with an Agfa Click, which is another medium format camera that normally takes 120 film, you can see how the whole of the 35mm film has been exposed and the image is in the area where the sprockets are. Now that is actually the case with the images that were taken with this camera and film, but unfortunately the lab that I use to develop and scan my images can't do the sprockets. And my flatbed scanner is not set up at the moment. So in the interest of doing my best to make the Diana Day deadline of sharing the photographs within one month of taking them, I'm using the scans that the lab did me of the normal film area. Let's kick off with this image of the breakwater out in Heacham in Norfolk that was taken back in 2015. Do we have some glorious freakiness going on? There is something so good about this image with its massive starter film burn on the left and the wild colours on the right. Now this is the stuff that you don't get with digital photography. You can manipulate any image you want in the computer of course but this is photons landing on light sensitive emulsion bathed in chemistry with all the randomness of chance thrown in. And this is why I like to experiment with film and cameras. Now this shot is of beach houses out at Heacham, and you can see some of the odd framing that the lab ended up choosing, or not even choosing, they were just trying to deal with my film I guess. I'm perfectly happy with that random chance element that we can see going on here. And these murky colours match the dreams, sort of faded dreams of coastal holidaymakers with their little getaways. It's a nice little image. Meanwhile, here is my cousin, Bosher, who doesn't look like he wants to have his photo taken very much. But it happened, and he's a good lad, so bosh on, Bosher. Now, this is what we want. A glorious nuclear sunset. In fact, something actually interesting is going on here with the whole setup because you can see on the right hand side a little bit of the sunset that looks okay and then this great big red blast right from the middle going out to the left. Now I wonder if the film got overexposed while I was trying to get it in the camera or if it's some sort of double exposure mistake with the number of clicks I needed when winding on the film. I don't really know but I do know that if I was trying to create this image digitally I probably wouldn't have the courage or even inspiration to block out so much of it in such a vivid red. This is the sort of thing that happens best by chance, and I absolutely love it to bits. Now this next image was taken a few weeks later in Oxfordshire, at the White Horse at Uffington. The White Horse is a prehistoric monument, uh, an image of a horse carved out of the hillside in chalk. But this red colour is still leaking in, and it's making the green grass look like orange velvet. Again, could you actually ever cook this up in the computer? I don't really know. But to me, Chance played such a big part in this image, swapping out of the green for an orange like that. 
it's bold and I really like it. In contrast, this image which shows the white horse is a far more faithful rendering of the actual day and it shows the colours as they ought to be. And if you look at the hill on the right hand side, you can see it start to blur through the Diana's plastic fantastic lens. It's not quite as groovy and saturated as the previous image, but it is the Diana working as it's meant to as a camera. The interesting thing is that, perhaps like you, I had a pair of toy binoculars as a kid with plastic lenses, and they did the same thing, rendering everything kind of blurry and coloured towards the edges. So it's perhaps not surprising that these images have a nostalgic feel for an old guy like me. Now what is going on here? Well, right back at the start of this video, you can see me cocking the shutter of the Diana over and over to show how it could be used to expose the film multiple times, either by accident or intention. Well, this is actually that shot. You can see these lines, they're actually the Venetian blinds in my lounge, because I shot that video next to the window in order to make use of natural light, and the camera was pointing upwards when I was cocking the shutter. This is absolutely crazy, and I totally love it. It's the sort of thing that looks like a digital image that's gone wrong, but instead it started out as purely analogue, and it's gloriously terrible. Now here is an actual Diana Day photograph, taken out of the guesthouse window just like the other ones, and it pretty much looks the same, except for the chimney breasts. I don't know if you can spot it, but there's some sort of odd double exposure thing going on, some sort of ghosting. I can't work it out, and in fact I can't explain it. But the next few images are definite double exposures, and these are almost certainly caused by me not winding on the film enough. I will confess that I had abandoned the 80 clicks idea, and I thought I could manage by guessing. Clearly that didn't work, but it gave its own rewards in the shape of these mashed up images, where you can see two rows of houses laying on top of each other. Now here is another mashup with railings and light leak saturation going on. I think this is a wonderful happy accident. It's not possible to plan something like this. I think it's completely brilliant. And finally, in the Diana Day images, we have this one of the factory that I was talking about earlier. Now look at that insane cherry tone that is all over the image. How did that happen? It's absolutely amazing. Now you show me the filters, show me those filters man, and the settings in whatever digital setup you have that will get you an image like this. And even if you can, you won't get the satisfaction of creating this from a plastic box cobbled together with a bunch of random stuff. This is f***ed up analogue at its best, and that grade one sign says it all. Now this is a classic James Davies photograph, a sunset, foliage and a telephone pole. There's little else to say about this one, except that, well, this picture, and actually this one, and this one, are all shots where I really thought we were getting to the end of the film, and I just wanted to get it out of the camera and get it sent off to the lab. Honestly, I don't know what the lab think of some of the things I end up sending to them, but these are really only good examples of a bored bloke trying to get his project wrapped up. And wrapped up we have it. Now on reflection, Diana Day was a great thing to do. So a big thank you to Denise for pushing it as much as she did and for encouraging me to get with it and join in. I'm genuinely inspired to get these Diana cameras back out and loaded with more film after seeing the results. I'm not going to go into too much details, but it's been a crazy summer for me and some of these shots hit me hard with their craziness. It's this overloaded, wacky end of analogue. is as much fun as a water fight. It's Jimi Hendrix with his strap going into a marshal at full blast, or Radio Moscow floating in through the ether on medium wave late at night. It's a letter which you stood a glass of water on and which blurred all the ink, or it's driving in the dark with music up loud and other cast passing by in a blur. There's an echo going on through all of these pictures. It just makes sense to me, and it, it shows me that what I do is worth doing, even if it's just for me. And with that in mind, we are at the end of show 10, of series two of Photo Chat Vlog. Will there be a series three? Well, yes. The channel is small and the views are low and my videos are infrequent and they take a lot of time to make. 
Uh, people have even commented that it's somewhat audacious for me to have different series and episodes for something that has almost no audience. But it's fun trying out new ways of showing photographs and ideas and thoughts. And I already have some cameras and techniques I want to talk about in future videos. So watch this space for season three. And of course, a new set of opening titles and maybe a new theme tune. Some YouTube channels have a million subscribers. I think I've got 49 as I write this. But if you are one of those 49 people, thank you for bothering to put me in your subscriptions. It really means a lot to know that people look at these videos. And if you look at this video and you're not a subscriber, why don't you click and help me get to 50 and maybe even further. So as ever, if you do like the video, why not leave a comment or a thumbs up? The URL on this slide that always ends the videos on this channel, well, if you've never visited it, it's for a page where you can find most of my shared online life. My blog, my Twitter, my Instagram, Flickr and Tumblr are all linked from it. Much of the output is the same across all of them, but each of them has a different audience. And if you use any of those services, feel free to follow me there as well. But for now, goodbye.